The success of us with the CF6-6 and the CF6-50 would lead to an important relationship for GE that would change forever our company and commercial aviation around the world. And that is the formation of CFM International that was really born out of those early days of the CF6. You see, in order to support the Airbus A300 with our CF6-50, we needed European content in the engine. So GE seeks out the help of MTU and also a company called Snecma, a very historical company in France. René Raveau had a vision. He's the leader of Snecma at that time as did the French government, to become major players in this burgeoning, growing airline industry. And so they called it the 10-ton engine. They wanted to develop an engine that had 20,000 pounds of thrust to compete against Pratt & Whitney and power the narrow-body aircraft of the day. And they approached Rolls-Royce, and they approached Pratt with no success. And they came to GE, and we, they had had a good relationship with us because they were suppliers for our CF6 engine and a marriage is formed, and it wasn't easy to create CFM International. For example, one of the challenges was, we had offered to use the hot section of the F-101 military engine powering the B-1 bomber. We would marry that hot section, compressor, combustor, and high pressure turbine, to the low pressure system and the front fan designed by Snecla. This would give us this new engine they called the 10-ton engine, 20,000 pounds of thrust to provide power for these new narrow-body aircraft that are emerging. But the U.S. government said no way. They denied the application for an export license for our technology for the F-101 core. Things get challenging for the partnership at that point because they're facing a significant roadblock. But in 1973, President Pompidou of France meets with President Nixon of the United States for a trade agreement discussion in Iceland. And on the agenda for these talks was the export license for this F-101. President Pompidou from France was adamant about creating this joint company between GE and his national engine maker, Snecma. And different negotiations throughout that trade agreement finally lead at the end to a discussion of this export license. And Nixon does grant that license for the formation of CFM International because there were a lot of really tremendous restrictions in that because remember the F-101 was designed by U.S. government money and so we agreed to pay a certain amount of money on every CFM engine made. But here's another challenge. We formed CFM International in 1974, this unique partnership between GE and Snecma of France, but we didn't have an airplane to put the engine on. Uh, at that time, we struggled. We were trying to get it on a 707 re-engine program. There were a couple programs in Europe, one with that so that never came to fruition. And from 1974 to 1979, there isn't a single engine order for our CFM partnership. In fact, the partnership was just weeks away from being terminated when something very special happened for the company. One was the noise regulations in the United States were becoming more stringent, so some of the really older airplanes were going to need to be re-engined in order to be able to fly. There was a very large fleet of DC-8s out in service with three companies, the most notably being Delta and United, and they wanted to continue flying those planes, but they were going to need to re-engine them in order to be compliant with the noise regulations. And so a competition was held. This is CFM's big chance to get on to a commercial application competing against Pratt & Whitney. There was an evaluation conducted by United Airlines, and the head of this uh, evaluation from the board was a man named Neil Armstrong, who lived in Cincinnati, was the first man on the moon. We all know him as one of our most famous astronauts. He did a, an evaluation of the propulsion offerings of both Pratt & Whitney and the new CFM, and suggested that United go with CFM, with an engine we call the CFM 56-2. Successfully, we were in powering those airplanes, those DC-8 airplanes, but then this would lead to a very rapid growth for the joint company. Because we had been doing work with Boeing for years on a 707. And the 707, of course, is what they used to develop the, the KC-135 tankers. So after launching the CFM engine, the CFM 56-2, in 1979 on DC-8s, we're then able to launch it 
to re-engine KC-135 tankers, both for the U.S. Air Force inventory and then for the inventory in France. This program would go on for decades, really firmly planning CFM success. 1981, Boeing comes along looking at a new family of 737s, and we secure a contract as sole source with the CFM 56-3. Before long, Airbus is developing a competitor to the 737 called the A320. We then develop a variant of our CFM 56 engine for that as well. We then power the A340, and then subsequent generations of A320s so today, CFM, with its new LEAP engine, has secured three applications. We have the 737 MAX, the A320neo, and also a new narrow body being developed in China called the COMAX C919. And those aircraft and the success of them so far has allowed CFM to have a backlog of more than 15,000 LEAP engines, both orders and commitments. So this company that we created back in the early 70s that nearly died with this inability to get an export license for the F-101 core, and then nearly died again in 1979 without securing a commercial application for the program, the tenacity of both GE and SNECMA, which becomes Safran, was just incredible. And they held together through the years and then through the decades. And one by one, we have dramatically grown the success of this company where we are today, where it's wildly popular and significant for both GE, for Safran, and of course the LEAP engine is extremely important for the entire commercial aviation industry.